Well, Rob, do you want to start first so I can trash you afterwards? Is that all right? <laughs> you start first. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, basically, I don't think John and I are, are that uh, different. I mean, I, I don't think that you're looking at inflation, but I think there's that risk. And because there's that risk, I think you have to build that into your portfolio. So, for instance, in our, our portfolios, uh, we are very cognizant of the inflation risk that we have in it. You know, in, in the fixed income area and bonds, we tend to keep very short term. We do have a portion allocated to gold, which is a good inflation hedge. And also, I think real estate is a good inflation hedge. So it's, you know, I think that when you try and judge how this is going to play out and you know, what John talked about, the debt levels and what I brought up, inflation is a scenario that you absolutely have to be aware of. You know, we don't see signs of it happening yet, but it could. And, and if you're not looking for it, you can really get blindsided with uh, your, your returns in your portfolio. Yeah, my, uh, my view generally, you know, Peter, when I'm looking at inflation is I tend to look at the fundamental issues that would make prices rise or fall. And I know that, you know, there's a strong theory, uh, monetary theory, that if you print a lot of money, you're going to get a lot of inflation, and that's the end of the discussion. And that all you need to do is print money, and it creates, and it inflates things. Yeah. I don't see it nearly as simple as that. I, I see uh, a lot of factors that make a difference. And so, if you have, in the macro sense of things, we have a massive increase over the last decade in global, the, the, the global uh, labor population that essentially is fundamentally democratic and able to work as they want to work. And that population, that labor population is probably close to 3 billion people now. And it's increased by a huge amount and we have an, a huge amount of unused capacity in virtually every human endeavor you can think of. That's a very tough environment to raise prices in. And it's also very hard for, for workers to get traction on wage increases. So if those two things don't happen, you're not going to get inflation. So that's, I, I, while you'll get inflation in some areas, like you might in commodities where there are limited amounts of them, I think generally speaking, I find the inflation argument not particularly compelling. But Rob's right, a lot of our investments do have sort of a built-in inflation bias. But the assumption I make in terms of future inflation is that at best it'll be modest. I'm sure governments would like it to be higher than it is. Rob made the point it reduces their debt obligations if they can get away with it. I'm just making the argument I don't think that they will get away with it. And maybe a perfect example of that is, a, or a microcosm of that is, is consider the issue with Greece right now. Now here's a country that's got a massive deficit. They are having to pay interest rates of 6%, which is higher than the inflation rate. So it, they can't inflate their way out of the debt. Because if, if they started with $100 of debt this year and they had 3% inflation, that debt is only worth $97 a year from now. But because of the 6% interest rate, they owe $103. They're getting further and further behind by adding to that debt. So unless a country can choose to default on its debt, which obviously you saw some of the stuff that Rob and I looked at, countries do default. But unless default is the choice, I don't see if, if countries basically say at some point we have to repay or reduce this debt, that process is more deflationary than inflationary. So that's my bias towards the arguments. And, but I agree with Rob, having a portfolio that can protect you against some levels of deflation, but also be an inflation hedge is not, these are not in conflict. And that's one of the reasons we do, for instance, like income producing real estate. If we end up with a deflationary environment, then our rents aren't going to go up. They may even decrease, but the cost of our financing is going to come down at the same time. So those two things can work together to make the real estate sustainable. So generally speaking, that's my view of, uh, the reason I'm leaning toward that more deflationary, disinflationary argument. So one, one quasi rebuttal to that is in the presentation when I talked about the four different ways that deleveraging can play out, I talked about three of them, I didn't talk about default. And the reason is that in the US, uh, default really isn't an option. And why isn't it an option? It's because the US would never default on their debt because they can always just print more money. The, the default option is, is not a US issue. You could say that high inflation or hyperinflation is a form of default. Greece, however, if they stay in the euro, yeah, they can default because they don't have the ability to create more euros. That's 
the you know the European market's ability. It's the you know the old Bundesbank, I would argue, that really controls the money supply in Europe, not Greece. So default for Greece, unlikely, but it's more possible than you would ever see in, in the US. So when we talk about high inflation or hyperinflation, that's the default option. And you know, as much as you know, we showed the graphs and, and John showed you those obligations, one of two things have to happen. Either you eventually default or you, 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 you reduce those obligations, you reduce spending. One of the two have to happen. And that's why it's that inflation scenario that you have to be aware of. If you don't see them cutting obligations, as John pointed out, it doesn't add up. Something's got to happen. Something's got to give. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. So it's, it's how this particular crisis on unfunded liabilities unfolds that's really worth watching. And if some country starts to take the lead on it, or there's an increase in, of consciousness amongst the population at large, my guess is you're not going to see politicians leading this. It'll be some grassroots kind of, maybe something like this Tea Party movement in the States, but one with maybe a half a brain, that would be helpful, uh, that would be able to look at the liability issues and say, how do we want to allocate our resources so that we actually don't hand over this huge amount of obligations to the future generations? It's, gonna, it's an interesting moral dilemma as well.